Hi, everybody. How you doing? Uh, this is my good friend, Ken McAuliffe, the jazz vinyl lover. He's an audiophile, knowledgeable guy. He's a jazz writer. He's a go-to guy in this community in terms of people who respect and want to know what's going on with jazz and publications and upcoming releases. He's a go-to guy. My name is Dan. I'm the Jazz Shepherd. I'm living here in the frozen upper Midwest of America. I love jazz. I love to talk about it. I love to talk about the social ramifications of it. And my collection has been my study, as it were. So I hope you enjoy this little question back and forth that we, a tat -a -tat, as, I, as they say. Thanks for intro, Dan. And uh, Dan has, if you don't know, uh, Dan's Jazz Shepherd uh, channel on YouTube. It's highly educational. Dan has an incredibly deep uh, well of knowledge about recordings, about musicians, about the details behind the recordings, the social constructs. I learn something every time we do one of these. And I defer to his great, uh, vast, seemingly bottomless <laughs> amount of knowledge that you have on so many things. And I, I, somebody asked you a question the other day in one of our groups. You have the you have a complete fifteen hundred series Blue Note collection. Yeah, I have the whole four thousand series too. That's just nuts. Plus, you have like complete Savoy Bethlehem. Yeah, I got the first hundred and fifty Savoy, the, all hundred and eighty Bethlehems, including the entire ten inch series. And how many are those? Of how, about how many Argos do you have? About 230, which is pretty much everything except for one, which I wow. can't find anywhere. Emerson, I have about 225, Just which insane. is most of the Emerson catalog. That includes some Mercury stuff, but they're synonymous. Uh, Verve, I have almost 600 Verve records. Jeez. Almost You're 600. Lucky. You have space. You're lucky. Not to yeah. mention you, you've, you've done the work, which a lot of people don't understand. There are things called cars that drive to things called stores you yeah. have fingers and you go through it's not just like pushing the button to order it yeah. from uh, amazon you've done all the work I, I know you buy stuff online as well but that's astounding i mean i, I have more argo classical records than i do jazz <laughs> records wow. are you talking are about the uk company? label yeah it's a different label i don't have that many yeah. argos you have created uh, 10 great great questions this is something that comes from actually our facebook groups primarily a lot of people are spouting opinions and for example, I'll hear someone say something about a guy like Sonny Stitt and say, well, this is Sonny Stitt's best record. And I know myself, I have 50 Sonny Stitt records and I'm missing 40. He's the worst example. He has more records than anybody. Just you know what I mean? And there's so many guys like that though. And I, whenever I hear someone say, well, this is his best album. And I've been watching this guy post for the last six months. I know he's got like a hundred jazz records because that's what his knowledge tells me. And yet he's professing that this is so-and-so's best record with a limited base of knowledge. It's like, I have 50 of the guys' records. I could never begin to tell you what his best record was. Right. You know? And so the question is, what percentage of a particular subject should one who offers opinions need to have for it to have any merit? Again, if you're going to be at work on a car and you would know 10% of the car information, you probably shouldn't be touching my car. And there's nothing wrong with saying this is my favorite or from what I've read, this is his best. But if you're going to quantify and say, I think this is his best record, what percentage of that artist's discography should you know in order to be saying that? Well, the good thing about uh, Facebook, there are good things about Facebook. Uh, some of those little things you can do, you can choose an expert. As admins, we can choose our experts. And those yeah. are people who, for me, have made great commentary for a long period of time. Let's go on to number two. Um, are you more of a Sarah Vaughn or a Peggy Lee fan? This one might surprise you, but I'm a huge Peggy Lee fan. Me too. I think she's adorable. I think she's fun. I think she's got her tongue in her cheek at all times. She's promiscuous, flirtatious, naughty, and delightful. Uh, I just love her flirtatious, cheeky smile. Uh, she sang with some of the swing bands early on, and then she comes into her own in the late 40s on Decca, and then, of course, her stuff at Capitol. She's one of the fun jazz slash pop singers. And she's not always in a jazz format, but when she is, she's just wonderful. And even in the pop format, she's always fun. And a lot of her lyrics are kind of cheeky as well. I love Sarah, but the vibrato at times, it's a little too intense. It's a little too dramatized, almost like it's hard work at times sitting there because she's so amazing. And it's always so pitch perfect and it's almost a little much. I don't know how it's hard to explain it, but I don't listen to Sarah much like I, like I should. 
Yeah, I agree you? with that. I mean, I love Peggy Lee. She's the epitome of cool, but she's yeah. a great singer. I think she probably could have been a great actress. I'm sure she does some parts, but she no. sings really hard. She's really sly. So much yeah. great material. Even the later stuff, you know, she had pop hits near the end of her life, which is That All yeah. There Is, which is a strange song about suicide. That's a great yeah. song, actually. Pardon? That's a great song. Yeah, it is. It, it really is. And she made a lot of great records. Uh, she's not necessarily just a jazz singer. Um, when I first started getting into, into, into jazz as a kid, Sarah Vaughn was always on public TV. And I liked sure. her a lot at first. But like all those Pablo records and the vibrato you're talking about are just, it's so overdone. And man, yeah. I can't take it. But uh, her early cool. stuff when she with Roy yeah. Haynes is in her trio, the stuff yeah. at Emerson, I think that stuff's amazing yeah. when she's young. Yeah. She's a real trailblazer. But right. that's like 1970. I got no, I don't have any of her records. And um, yeah. I think she's a great uh, person for maybe people just getting into jazz. That's what she was for me. But, yeah. but uh, her records are easy to find. Peggy Lee records aren't that easy to find in my experience. Oh, especially the like Capitol. Stuff, but... The Capitol stuff's not too tough to come by. Right. The, the early or mid 50s stuff's tougher than the early 60s stuff. You know, the George Shearing record you can find for a buck. But some of the really cool ones are tougher to find for sure. But uh, I never passed up one of her records from the from the 50s, especially. And her life story, for those who don't know, she was a very mischievous, cunning liar, married several times. Wow. Uh, it, it, I've read bits of her bio, and she's a mysterious, dangerous dame. Let's wow. just say that. From North Dakota, of all places. Wow. Yeah. High Plains Drifter Lady. 100%. Um, yeah, she's really great. And there's so many. Well, we'll get into that later when you ask what makes a jazz singer. That's such an interesting yeah. question. There's so many levels yeah. strata in that question. Number three, do you love and play more MRC, such as Clifford Jordan, Sarah versus Dinah, Helen Merrill, Cannonball, Adderley, or Argo Chicago Jazz, Sonny Stitt, Ama Jamal, James Moody, Illinois Jacquette, you go. Uh, in part because of Scott Baldwin, I probably play more Argo nowadays because he's a huge Argo guy, being a Chicago guy. And for those of you who don't know, Emerson and Argo are the two great Chicago record jazz labels and, and house studios. They both did a lot of great work. Emerson was affiliated with uh, Mercury Records. And so they had really good distribution because Mercury had a pressing plant in Chicago and one in St. Louis. So they really pushed those records across the country, making them fairly easy to find compared to Argo. Argo was affiliated with the Chess label in Chicago, which was a blues label run by Phil and Leonard Chess. And they had a real knack for discovering black talent, uh, bringing black talent up from the South. But they were very exploitive and treated their black musicians very poorly from almost all accounts. Mm. But that being said, when they launched Argo in 56, uh, it's really bluesy really gutsy it's always great jazz with roots in it uh it's got some gospel to it um embassy seems to kind of more fluctuate between poppier bluesier more gospel uh more modern argo seems to have more of an established thing that they're doing uh just early argos are just fantastic a lot of them have been never reprinted which makes some of those early argos really tough to find find that paul gonzalez record for under 500 bucks that Clark Terry record on Amory, on Argo, find that one. You know what I mean? Uh, Pinky Winter is the great blues jazz singer. Her record on Argo is like the fourth or fifth release. It took me four years to track that down. I've never heard of that. Oh, it's it's a great record too, man. Uh, Howard Roberts is on it. Uh, I can't remember the other players, but it's just a quartet, and it's just beautiful, soft, blues-filled, and she's a wonderful singer. She has a few uh, records on other labels, but she was mostly a uh, – cabaret lounge singer in chicago and la pinky winters is fantastic that record on argo is top of the mark i listen to argo all the time me and scott baldwin talk argo all the time but emerson does have a probably a better legacy of big names mm -hmm. in part because mercury was a bigger house uh bigger production better paychecks uh, better distribution so you get the clifford brown you got the sarah Vaughan, you have the dino washington you have young cannibal adderley you have a lot of blues stuff that was recorded in the 40s that Emerson is reissuing in the 50s on the LP. So both labels, their first 150 titles, every record in those in those sequences is worth having. 
And a lot of them you can find for under 10 bucks. And right. I've said this before on my channel, and I'm going to say it again right now. Early Argo, early Emerson, on almost any label from the 50s, they didn't let you in the studio to waste that expensive tape if you couldn't play. And so it's different in the 80s and 90s when, and nowadays, when anyone can make a record and put it out and distribute it. In those days, you didn't get to even in the door unless you had some serious ability and have been earning your chops playing live or working with a swing band or been a teacher or just somehow you had proved yourself. Mm -hmm. And so even, even the names you've never heard of on Argo and Emerson, those guys can play. Uh, yeah, the, the MRC titles, it's funny. Uh, in New York, it's really easy to find the MRC Japanese reissues. I don't know why. Sure. It's kind of strange. Yep. Those are really easy to find. But looking at these, except for uh, Helen Merrill and Clifford Brown, I really don't. I mean, Cannibal Adderley records are great in our store, but they just kind of sit there. I don't know why. Even great ones on MRC, it's kind of strange. But I think really? I, like, I like the bluesy or funky or harder swinging Stuff on Argo, Sonny Stitt, Ahmed Jamal, James Moody. I don't yeah. know the Illinois Jacquette on Argo. Um, They're great. Yeah, but I, 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 it's, it's less slick, it's funkier, it's more urban sounding to me, less designed yeah. for households or something, even though Clifford yeah. Brown, of course, is, is uh, preeminent. But yeah, generally the Argo and those particular artists on Argo, I think are harder, harder to find. Jamal, Moody, yeah. Illinois Jacquette, then... Uh, Helen Merrill is pretty hard to find as well. Very hard. Um, Helen Merrill's record with Clifford Brown goes for thousands of dollars. Right. Beat up these. Yeah, the, and, all those all those Helen Merrill records, if you can find them in good shape, are worth quite a bit. Yeah, um, and the one with strings is an awesome record. Helen Merrill with strings, it's like thirty six zero five nine or something like that. That record is outstanding. All the versions of those songs and that are just beautiful versions that I've DJed at my brunch sets many times. I love yeah. Helen. Fred just brought in a, a collection and have the Helen Merrill country record recorded in the seventies, pure huh. country. I had wow. no idea. And this guy's uh, oh. uh, Brian, a, a bond investor who comes in store, snapped that right up. Um, oh, wow. Yeah. That was really shocking. Um, this huh. is an interesting question. Who had a bigger impact on Coltrane Monk or miles? I think Monk had a huge influence on both of those guys, much yeah. more so than, either one or other you hear those stories about miles i've heard this twice i forgot who told me miles T i think t.s monk told the story miles would go to weehawken and he would wait for monk to wake up they wouldn't wake him up he'd say no i'll just wait he would wait like in the ante room waiting yeah. for monk to wake up and um right. and crafted an amazing one of the first craft reissues which i've never seen anybody post i'm lucky to still have it the the complete uh coltrane and monk sessions and they did it in this big like school folder with a wraparound tie and everything uh cool. monk just seems to loom so large over over everything yeah. uh yeah so i i think that's the answer for me that's the answer to that question neither monk or miles on train but monk on both miles and train i'm gonna surprise you with this i'm gonna say miles i'm gonna first qualify by saying monk had an amazing impact on coltrane in 57 58 playing with him that year uh, developing Coltrane's sound and moving him forward into more avant-garde and the edges and the dissonance and Monk flirts with. Uh, I think that was very impactful of where Coltrane's uh, trajectory was to go. Yeah, you can hear so that Monk, on that crap set, the complete yeah, crap Yeah, Monk set. really shapes and opens up some doors and windows in Coltrane's mindset. Because Coltrane was very much sheets of sound and doing the, 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 the drugs and just overplaying almost before Monk and Monk kind of probably never verbally just more by example, puts him kind of in a check and gives him a different perspective on how to play. But Miles impact on, on Coltrane, I think is immense because he fired him for Coltrane, not for heroin, not once, but twice. And he also showed him how to run a band. No doubt about it. Yeah, I'm sure. A lot about, a lot about yep. form business. You, know, you, you and I have a discussion I mean, and I don't want to get into it here, but we've talked a lot about no. our feelings about Miles Davis. But yeah. I mentioned that to my friend um, Paul Wells, who's a plays with Vince Giorgio on the Nighthawks. And he said, if you listen to the complete Freedom Jazz Dance sessions, you can hear all the dialogue between the musicians. And Miles is directing everybody in the band. It's not them. It's not him asking what to play. It's him directing them. But I'm sure his direction to Coltrane uh, helped him in his, in his own bands moving forward. Yeah. And I think, like I said, Coltrane quitting heroin was very important 
and Miles had a lot to do with that. When you get fired from the best job in jazz, that's going to open up a few eyelids and scare you a little bit. And Miles, of course, had his own addiction, which he was also dealing with. But uh, I think Miles definitely taught John some of the business acumen, like you said, and getting getting sober was a necessity or else the stuff was going to kill you. And obviously Monk had a great impact on Coltrane as well, but Miles' impact was undoubtedly very strong current for yeah, Coltrane well, to follow. Playing his band for all those years. Have I told you that Fred Cohen has the uh, uh, Miles Davis's, I mean, John Coltrane's original prestige records contract? He bought, oh, it like, wow. he bought it for like five grand like 15 years ago. And, That's um, awesome. Yeah, just in the back room. And it's some ridiculous amount, like $500 for three records or something, you know. That's – this is how much – these guys work so hard for so little, you know. And another thing to recognize here is the difference between what the black musicians made and were possible to make versus what the white cats, who are often kind of imitating – and, and grafting this black music into their own vernacular, these white cats had far better paying labels to work for. You mean the leaders in particular? You're talking about the leaders. The side men, I think, all got the same. Oh, I think when you look at like Pacific Records and Contemporary Records, all those white cats, they were making a lot more than what any of the black cats were making. You're talking about the and leaders. I think the side men, too. How can you Canton. confirm that? There's no way to confirm that. Well, That's just an opinion. I, I mean, think all those guys in the same look, sessions together. When you look at even where the white cats were able to play, the American college scene, where everyone that, from that's a different back, question. That's a different question. That's part the question of, as part to the what revenue. they got. The question as to what they got paid in a studio session. Studio sessions then and now, I think, are done in three-hour blocks of time. And I, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that. Uh, for instance, and uh, to put it on Miles, that Bill Evans is getting less pay the jimmy cobb or vice versa i think in a session like that even right. in world pacific i think they're all getting the same money the leader oh, i agree more money yeah i agree but i, I don't think that in a, in a particular session there was different pay scales like that but i'm just saying in general the money that the white cats could make was far greater far easier to make and well, I agree with that. You, got sure. paid, you got paid more at contemporary than a black guy did at prestige but and i contemporary I wonder- it's funny, all the Blue Note leaders are all like primarily black anyway. But, 100%. Um, you yeah. know that the last white leader on a Blue Note record under Alfred Lyon was number 1529, I think it is, the Jody Hip and Zut Sims record. And there's a J.R. Monterose in there somewhere, 1532. Lou Monty, Lou Monty 10-inch. But I'm saying J.R. Monterose at 1532, whatever it is, right. is the last record led by a white cat at Blue Note. Right. Yeah. You know, and it's, it's partly offered lines design, but it's also partly that this label doesn't pay me very good. I'd go to contemporary and get paid twice as much, or hopefully Verve or Columbia or Capital get paid five times as much. Of course, those are large labels. Yeah. Right. But, but I, yeah. I would I would think that um, aren't most of the leaders all white on Pacific? Well, I think yeah. Carmel Jones yeah. is one of the leaders, right? He did some. Uh, Chico Hamilton was probably the big uh, acceptance there. He was, a, you know, a light skinned brother, Chico. Joe but, Gordon uh, on contemporary. Yeah, most of the most contemporary and Pacific were mostly white guys on the Canton groups, from the uh, Woody Herman groups, getting chances to be leaders and recording and we're using all their own sidemen from these bands, making some really exciting, cool, bop, modern jazz. And those records had far better distribution and were repressed frequently. And they're a lot easier to find Pacific and contemporary than those small New York black labels like Prestige and Riverside, Savoy, Blue Note. Those records are rare for a reason. I, I, not here in New York City. It's much easier to find a, a Prestige record, um, even a contemporary, than a World Pacific. I mean, those Original are, pressings? Any Original pressings? pressings? Any pressings. I, I thought, I went, to the, uh, I went to Berkeley two years ago, and I thought, this is great. I'm going to find all these records. World Pacific, Contemporary. I didn't find it. I found one Arnie Lawrence record on Contemporary, I think. Or... Well, one way we can disregard ge- geography is just looking on Discogs. Right. And if you look for a Lenny Niehaus record from Contemporary on Discogs, he's got five or six records on that first 100 records. You'll find all of them, probably 10 copies. You know, go find an original Hank Mobley on Discogs. You'll find Japanese pressings. You might well, find that's Luna, but that's the right. that's Luna. That's they're right. bigger than anybody. They're more collectible than anything. 
But you know, those the originals whole... are rare as rare as dirt. They're so rare. Which you ones? Know? Original blue notes. They, they sold oh, so hell yeah, they're impossible. I mean, without a doubt, I see that at the store. As where yeah. you know, it's really weird on discogs with with contemporary. It's hard to know what reissues they are because the variations are slight. It's really hard yeah. to know. Yeah. Um, yeah. But but don't you think back to the other question that uh. World Pacific, contemporary, fantasy. You don't think they played all paid all leaders the same money for recording sessions? Probably, but those labels didn't sign a lot of black leaders. Right, because all. they're all jazz, they're all underground, mm -hmm. minor labels, you know, anyway. Right. But uh, yeah, in New York, I mean, it's still, I go to Academy, I went, there's a new store called Ergo in, uh, on Second Avenue, you'll find a prestige. You might be beat or an A1. A1 has all kind of old beat shit like that. But you can definitely find more old prestige uh, stuff in general than any West Coast labels. And even buying through Discogs, I can tell you that Blue Note Prestige, Bethlehem, Savoy, Riverside, I would say 60% of those records are in the New York tri-state area. New Jersey, Connecticut, upstate New York. Right. I've bought a lot of those records from Discogs, and they're always coming from Brooklyn, coming from Weehawken, coming from someplace in upstate New York, like Syracuse. The Bronx, coming from Upper Manhattan, yeah, Yonkers. Yeah, they're not coming very often from Albuquerque. Fred just bought a uh, the same collection that had, um, I forgot what I referenced, but he bought a, a big collection from this guy in his 90s who wrote some, important books on Benny Goodman. And uh, oh, wow. and so now when I go in the store, you know, the Duke, Duke Ellington, Dizzy Gillespie, all those sections are much bigger. And of course, nice. a, lot, a lot of those records just sit there. Um, Sad. People always go for the same thing. Um, yep. Which do you play, Miles Second Quintet or Coltrane Quartet LPs? That's an inter interesting question. <clears throat> and two outstanding forward-thinking avant-garde groups with a lot of edge to them both. And I'm going to surprise you again. I listen to more Second Miles Quintet. Wow, nowadays. really? Nowadays, uh, I used to listen to the Coltrane stuff so much. My first 10 years as a jazz guy, I was the biggest Coltrane disciple. You know, I would have gone to the church if I had the chance to. I loved John. The, the sincerity, the integrity, the earnest, compassion. He's just a very passionate, direct you know, interlocking it from his heart and soul into his horn. And Alvin and Jimmy and McCoy, they just kind of seem to link on to Coltrane and are very one, unified. And I love a lot of that early Coltrane stuff, but I don't play it very often anymore. I find myself playing ESP fairly frequently. Uh, I do like Phil DeCamagero quite a lot. Uh, Circles in the Sky, I, I love. They're edgy, but they're fun. And Shorter and Hancock are so brilliant. Uh, Hancock is just a revelation on some of those tracks. Some of his rhythmic percussiveness and then his melodic phrasing and, and then the angles and edges he does. Hancock was kind of opened up Pandora's box for me for piano players on some levels in that group. How about you? Uh, that, that I, I am surprised you listen more to the Miles Second Quintet. For years, those were the albums that brought me into jazz with the Miles Second Quintet records. I ate those things up. I just, yeah. mostly because of Tony Williams. His Never drumming TV. is incredible. I mean, all that stuff to me sounds like sure. it's still like from the past, it's from the future, it's innovative. It's there's a lot of chaos on those records. There's a yeah. lot of subtlety and abstraction. The Miles Quartet, the Coltrane Quartet records, as great as they are, people have more clear-cut defined roles. Um, and you and you kind of know what you're gonna get on all those records until they start to go free. But the yeah. Miles records, those are just, those are, those are much, such innovative, incredible records. And it's so weird that they never, in concert, they always still played all the same old standards. They never played those tunes live. And you wonder right. why. I guess he was using the, the live situation for just improvisational purposes and to get them familiar with each other. Then he just exploded it in the studio. But all those records is just astounding. Um, I think I think Shorter's compositions are pretty challenging. They're you know? incredible. Tony's stuff yeah. is very abstract and sparse, and his drumming's incredible. Herbie's amazing. You're right. Um, if if anything, I love Ron Carter, but sometimes he plays strange things. 
<laughs> not on, not just on those records, but on his own records. I have these great jazz trio records co- recorded in Japan, and he just plays mm-hmm. some odd, unmusical thing sometimes. I don't know. But uh, I've never noticed that. I'll have to listen for it. Yeah, a lot of these weird uh, 70s and 80s Japanese records. He's just kind of, yeah, I love those, those uh, Miles Second Great Quintet. Those are the Rosetta Stone. Those records led to so many other things. They're so innovative, yeah. so important. If you get into the whole sound of the pressings, it's so strange. Does those records have a singular sound? And then all the things with Bill Evans, I mean, Gil Evans, obviously, is much larger. They're taking advantage of the studio. But for some yeah. reason, you know, Kind of Blue sounds like it was recorded in a different studio. It's, it sounds like they brought in all the baff, baffles and they're like it's recorded at contemporary. It's a very different sound. Kind of Blue does sound intimate and condensed and warm. 